Hi, good morning, everyone. I'd like you to turn to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. This is a very familiar chapter, and this is the, the actual start of our walk through the book of Daniel this summer for our lives. Last week I pointed out to you that this book in the Bible is all about God being in control, the sovereignty of God. He is in control, and we really need to hear that message right now with everything that's happening all around us, changing almost every day, things happening across our country, in uh, places of power all over the world, lots of things happening, but we come right back to God's word and say, listen, Lord, you're in control. Nothing gets past you, and we praise you, Lord. So we're going to come back to Daniel. Just hold your place there in Daniel chapter 1. And I'd like to start off with a story. A Christian editor whose name is Dave Getz, he wrote about how his wife Jana, who's an experienced nurse, got a job with a new medical practice. She was very experienced and had worked in different practices, but now she's got a new job. And on the first day of her new job, a mother came in with her 18-month-old son. And that mother was just coming in for a physical, you know, like a, like a physical. She was coming in to get tested and to be checked that everything's fine. And she was bringing her 18-month-old son in for a vaccination. All right? So those two things. Well, this nurse, she took out her needle and the vaccine and everything and she gave that vaccination to that little boy but then as she had finished that off and was going to her next uh, task that she had at hand she realized something awful had happened and what had happened is she looked down into like her vest wherever all of the vials and things are and she realized that she injected that 18 month old with the wrong vaccine, the wrong vaccine, not the one that he needed. Well, instantly she became horribly afraid, and as she thought about this entire situation, she stepped out into the hall and she told herself, here's some of the things that she was telling herself, no one, it's going to be hard to see this, no one will ever know, this is what she's thinking, no one will ever know, no harm done, I can't tell the doctor. This is my first day on the job. The doctor will think I'm incompetent. It can't hurt him, can it? It doesn't hurt to be immunized for the same thing twice, but he needs the right vaccine. What will the mother say? You get the idea of what's going through her head. Okay, put yourself in her place. Now, the predicament that that nurse found herself in is not a unique one. It goes all the way back, everybody, to the Garden of Eden, this kind of circumstance. God's people have always been under the gun to give in to temptation. She's standing in the hallway thinking to herself, do I say anything? What do I do? Do I just let it ride and hope it... Yeah, you get the idea? We've always been under the gun to temptation. And you know what, everyone? Especially when it's dealing with, for instance, a good job or, uh, you know, social status, um, money, all different kinds of things. The decisions can get very difficult and very risky. You know, the idea of losing your job. You know, Jana, the nurse that we just talked about, she faced this. You all have faced it, and you will face it. And when we turn to Daniel chapter 1, what we've got here is we've got Daniel and his friends facing this as well. All right? The title that I've given, and this is so apropos, and young people, listen, put on your headphones, not to listen to music, but I mean your spiritual headphones, because listen to this title. We all need this, but especially our young people coming up in this world that you're growing up in, this is the title, How to Stand in a Fallen World. 
how to stand in a fallen world. We all need this. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ask him to just work in our hearts through this simple message. Father, we come to you this morning as your people because, Lord, without you we can do nothing. And so, Lord, I'm going to say words, but it's going to be by the power of the Spirit that you impress our hearts with those words. It's going to be your work, Lord, in the lives of your people that's going to make an impact. It's going to change the hearts of teenagers and middle-aged people and older people, Lord. So, Lord, we put our trust in you this morning and ask that you'll do a mighty work. And we pray for Jesus' sake and in his name. Amen. Now, we all learn from an early age that if we're going to move from one grade to the next in school, <laughs> we are going to have to pass tests. We can't go to the next grade unless we pass the majority of our tests. I suppose that you can flunk one test or two tests or something like that, but most of the time you're not going to do real well if you're, you keep flunking and keep flunking and so on and so forth. Tests, of course, right, in school, tests are expected. They're expected. You don't go to school and say, well, there's no tests. <laughs> They're expected, okay? Now, the same is true for us, everyone. The same is true for us in the school of life. The same is true for us in the school of life. God is going to confront us with situations which test our courage, which sometimes test our honesty, test our integrity. But we are going to be confronted no matter how we're going to be tested. Okay? In this lifetime, we're never going to get out of this, of this uh, school of life where we're God is going to be testing our mettle spiritually. Now, what's unfortunate as we're thinking of this theme of schooling is that a lot of, a lot of believers on planet Earth, unfortunately, they've been in like elementary school or junior high spiritually their entire life. Oh, they made it through, you know, their literal classwork, elementary, junior high, high school, maybe a college degree. They went through all that, but you know what? But spiritually speaking, some of them are like junior higher still, and some are worse. Hey, you know what? Some believers that are going to be with God forever and ever, some people that are going to, that have eternal life and that are going to, to live with God forever and ever, guess what? They're even like, children that are two years old, the terrible twos. And you know what? They're like little rebels, <laughs> right? They're just rebellious. God says, hey, look, you know, uh, my will for your life is, no, 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 no. I don't want to hear that. And yet they are believers. They've been born again. They've been saved. Their names have been written in heaven, but they're little rebels. <laughs> All you have to do is read your Bible Go through the, from Genesis to Revelation, and what do you see? You see God's people uh, rebelling and paying a huge price. They're getting tested, and they're flunking every step of the way. All right? In Daniel 1, Daniel and his four friends, and probably other believers back in that day, are getting tested. And this reminds us, and this is lesson number one for us this morning, in light of this idea of taking a stand for God, all of us, all of us will face circumstances which will test our loyalty to God. Did you hear that? Hey, young people, you know what? It's not just Pastor Bob, it's you too. You're going to be tested. You're going to face tests in your life. And either you're going to pass them or you're going to flunk them. And you know what? If you flunk them, you have to take them over. <laughs> Better to pass them. Okay, so how, how was Daniel tested? Man, he was tested. He's 15 years old, probably. He served for 70 years, 500 miles from home. Think of that, everybody. That's a test right there. He's 500 miles away from home, and he has to live there. Hey, we think, we think it's bad to go through the coronavirus March, April, May, three months now, going on four months. We think that's rough. Daniel was in Babylon for 70 years, never got back home, never got to see his uh, Jerusalem. 
or the tabernacle or temple. So what are some of the ways Daniel was tested? I'm going to go through these real quickly because these aren't my main points, but I want you to see these. First of all, a new home. A new home. We just said that. He's been taken 500 miles away to Babylon. And that's an a, a artist's rendering because it was an amazing, amazing city. One of the seven wonders of the world was in Babylon. Verse 1 tells us, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and he besieged it. He attacked it. And so he says, okay, soldiers, round up all of the smart, educated, sharp, good-looking. I want the best. I want the best. If they've only got one arm, I don't want them. If they've only got, you know, you get the idea. He's not taking this first, this first uh, exile that he's going to go. He did three of them, but the first one he takes the, cre the cream of the crop. Okay? So they're... Daniel, young people, is totally removed from a godly influence, okay? And by the way, probably, probably, not all of you, but probably some of you, most of you are going to go off to college. And you may go to a college 500 miles away, or you might want to go to one 200 miles away. But you're going to be away from home, and you know what? You're going to be tested. You're going to still honor God, or are you going to listen to all the people around you? You're going to stand up for what you were taught all these years in church and in your home? Or are you going to go along with the professors? Oh, yeah, that Bible, all that stuff, that's just all myths and fables and legends. It's not true. All right, you're going to, have te you're going to, you're going to face tests. So you got a new home. Not only that, they were trying to put a new worldview on him, weren't they? You know, worldview is just that. It's how you see the world. It's kind of these philosophical glasses you wear. Uh, a new worldview. Okay, he, he, he was raised up in a godly home and in a godly place for the most part. But guess what? Now he is over there and they're teaching him, look at verse 3, things he never heard before. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel, verse 4, whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans, of the Babylonians. The king says, okay, these young people that have come from Israel, we're going to teach them our language, and we're going to teach them our, uh, our culture, and we're going to teach them our literature. We want them to know our books. They only know one book, the Bible. We want them to know our books. And they indoctrinated them, okay? That's what happened. They got a new name. They got a new worldview. And young people, you go off to college, unless you go to a strong Christian college, which you can very well do, the college I'm attending right now is strongly Christian. You won't go to classes and hear professors put down God's word. Why? Because they're all strong believers. You can go to a school like that. And it's very advantageous because there's just a lot of garbage Hey, listen, some schools you go to now, they won't even let you say a peep. If you raise your hand in class and you say, say, can I share uh, some insights that I learned growing up from uh, my pastor or from the Bible I read? I've read the Bible. No, 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 not in this class we don't. We only, we only listen to truth. We don't listen to lies. We don't listen to fables. And, you know, Isaiah says they call what's good bad, they call what's lies truth. And they're going to try to indoctrinate you. That's the second thing. The third way was a new diet. Daniel and his friends, you know what? They were kosher. They were Jews. They, uh, oops, I'm supposed to stay behind the pulpit. They, they, they weren't used to eating foreign foods. There were things in the Bible that said from the Old Testament law that people during the Old Testament days couldn't eat. For instance, they couldn't eat. Uh, um, they couldn't eat. Did you, have, did you have pork? Is that what you said it was? Okay. Yeah, they couldn't eat that. They couldn't, no matter how, no, no matter how tender it was, Nathan, even if it was done in a big green egg, they could not eat 
shoulder, pork shoulder, okay? They couldn't do it. And you know what? Apparently, we're not told, but apparently they were given food and delicacies that they weren't supposed to eat. Look at verse 5. The king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank. In three years of training, did you hear that? We're going to brainwash these Jews. We're going to take their Jewish brain out and we're going to put in a Babylonian brain. Three years we're going to teach them our language and our literature and our customs and our ways. And they're going to forget about all that stuff they learned growing up as kids. And it says, so at the end of that time, they might serve before the king. If they're going to be in my court, Nebuchadnezzar said, they're going to learn what pleases me and what doesn't please me. So they had a new name, a new worldview, a new diet. Let me ask you this just for a second, go off a little bit. We're not talking about literal food. I'm not going to ask you how your earthly diet's doing, your physical diet. I want to ask you how your spiritual diet is doing. Okay? Are you, are you ingesting God's word? Are you ingesting sermons? Are you ingesting good, uh, uh, good teachings that are going to help you along in life? We've got to make sure that we're not eating 90% TV and music and videos and games and 10% God. You won't make it. Hey, what if all of a sudden, physically, you guys, what if all of a sudden I came up to you and I said, oh, by the way, tomorrow um, I'm going to, I'm going to ma uh, make you eat 90% uh, potato chips, M&M's, uh, hot dogs, uh, you know, go down the list. All the things that you should eat. Uh, every morning, it's going to be waffles for breakfast and lunch. It's syrup all over them. And, you know, just go down. And then I want you to put peanut butter all over it and make it even taste better. And so, you know what, if I said, that, that's going to be 90% of your diet, you know, think Willy Wonka. <laughs> And 10%, you're going to have some salad, and you're going to have uh, some good, clean, healthy water. Okay, well, you know what? Even if you ate seven days a week, that salad and that water, guess what? You'll get overwhelmed by all, everything else. Your health will be awful. You, you might get diabetes. I mean, it'll be awful. Why? Because God didn't make things to work that way. Same thing spiritually. God did make things to work where you just, man, video games and texting and this game and that game. You know what? Thank God these people, it finally, I finally outlasted them. These people kept sending me that are friends of mine from ages gone past, play Candy Crush with me. I get a thing bops up on my phone. I don't want to play Candy Crush. I don't have time to play Candy Crush, okay? And oh, yeah, but you know what? If all you do is games and, and movies and, you know, hey, by the way, I love movies. I'm a big fan. You know, last week for three hours one night, Kelly and I watched uh, Les Mis on Channel 13. And it was wonderful. It was from England from 2010. It's like the Broadway stage in England. And guess what? Nick Jonas was like one of the lead things. He was so young. He was only 18 years old. It was awesome. But guess what, you guys? That's not all that I do. There's got to be intake spiritually, praying, listening to God. You know what? This new name is num the fourth thing. Daniel got a new name. Okay, He got a new home, new worldview, new diet. He got a new name. Okay, Daniel. You know, Daniel means Dan... Judge, yell, Elohim, yell, Daniel. God is my judge. That's a good name. Elohim is my judge. But you know what name they gave him? They gave him this name in Babylon. Next slide, please. 
Belteshazzar. That's Daniel's new name, Belteshazzar. What does that name mean? It means literally, may the lady protect the king. May the lady protect the king. You say, what in the world? They, know what it, they knew what it meant in Babylon, which is this. May the lady, the wife of the false god, Bel, not, not Bel like you, Bel, B-E-L-L-E, B-E-L, Bel. That false god whose name was Bel. May the wife of the false god, Bel, protect the king. That's Daniel's new name. And guess what? Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they had names changed to Babylonian names. You know, the devil and the world around us don't want us to see ourselves like God wants us to see ourselves. Hey, who are we, everybody? We're children of the king. We're born-again believers. We're in Christ. We've got a new name written down in glory, the old song says. Because the Bible says if we're faithful to God and persevere to the end, that we'll be given a new name that no one else has. God alone is going to give us that new name. But guess what? The devil doesn't want anything to do with that. And so people go out and they have all kinds of crazy names inscribed all over them. I'm not, I'm not against tattoos, but you know what? They have them put on their foreheads. They might have 666 put on there you know, or Satan or something on their arm, you know, devil's advocate, or, you know, you name it. Judas is priest. (laughs) Go down the list. You could have all kinds of names. What they're saying is, hey, I put this name on my arm because this is who I'm siding with here. This is who I'm siding with. Okay? So not only does this world around us, the academics, the colleges, They want to change your name, but guess what? We got this problem too, everybody. They want to change our identities. You know what? This world around us, and people with a lot of money and a lot of power, they want boys to believe they're girls and girls to believe they're boys. Young people, if you hear that and you go, well, you know, that's that's some people just want that. No, no, no. God made Adam and Eve. God made man and he made woman and he didn't intend Adam, it it wasn't, and I've said this before, it wasn't Adam and Steve, okay? He didn't intend Adam to be married to Steve. He had Adam and Eve. Jesus said, they say, well, Jesus never preached against that. Yes, he did because he said from the beginning, God made them male and female, not she-male. You know, they're trying to change all these pronouns now. And rich and powerful people are pushing this. Evil people. Because they want men and women to be with their own sex. Folks, this is totally against God's plans for humanity. Now you say, Pastor Bob, do you hate those people? No. Because I have friends. Okay? I know people. And I don't hate them. But you know what? I pray for him. Hey, just, hey, look, look, everybody. What's, what's your besetting sin? Just, just like you pray for me and I pray for you, we have sins in our lives that are, are like the ones that kind of hang on, that we, we're trying to overcome, we're trying to kick, and yet they kind of hang on forever. It's, there are some things that are just very difficult. Okay? Hey, look. Some people, it's, it's, say, for instance, lying. Some people, it's uh, stealing. But for some people, it's this, it's this warped sexuality. God was the inventor. God invented this, and you know what? Satan warps it. Okay? God invents food. But you know what? We can warp that and, and make food our enemy. God invents uh, human interaction. He invents conversation and communication so we can interact. You know what? Dogs can't talk to one another with words. <laughs> God didn't make them that way, but he made us. But you know what? We warp it because we lie and we gossip and we slander. And the same thing with this. And so now 
in the schools are taking little tiny kids sometimes and they're trying to tell them, hey, you know, and you know what? I mean, they're trying to even pass laws to take away, par you know, they want to get parents out of the way. Don't you tell your child what they should be. Let them discover, no, 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 the way God made them when they were born, that's what they are. All right? You are either biologically male, you're biologically female. Okay, and I realize in rare, rare, rare cases, there are children that are born that are like a, a combo. Okay, but you know what? Those things can be dealt with with wisdom, and, uh, and they have to be dealt with with wisdom. But that is so, so rare. And it's an anomaly. It's, a, it's, it's like doesn't happen. Uh, it's, not, it's not normal. It's abnormal. When a child is born like that, the doctors don't go, oh, look at there. <laughs> it's abnormal. And it has to be dealt with surgically and has to be fixed. Okay? Therefore, moms and dads, grandparents, it's our job to pray and to teach the next generation. I'm doing my job for you young people so you won't have your brains filled with gunk that'll get God upset and angry. We're going to pray for you. We're going to teach the next generation what God has decreed, what God has said in his word, and what God expects of you. God expects something of you and me. Okay? Okay? He's not gonna, you're not going to stand before him one day and say, oh, yeah, you know what, Lord, um, you know, I, I knew that I shouldn't be uh, promiscuous before I get married. I knew I shouldn't do evil before I got married. But you know what? I, I knew that you said that, but I just, I just didn't want to do, you know, that, that's not going to float, you guys. He gives us expectations, and we're supposed to follow him. He's got desires for us. Okay, I went way too long on that, so let's wrap up point number one. But that's good stuff. Because what happened to Daniel and his friends, it's what's happening to all of us. Satan is fighting tooth and nail to ruin our lives, our children's lives, our grandchildren's lives, and this world's lives. Hey, folks, you know what? I don't look at what's happening on the news, whether it's a policeman kneeling on the neck of a man made in the image of God, or whether it's uh, wild, riotous people taking over parts, entire parts of a city like Seattle. I don't look at that. I don't look at that and say, oh, you know what? That's normal. They're just, you know, they're just, they're just, uh, they just have their beliefs. They've got bad beliefs. Bad ideas result in bad consequences. Buildings burning up is not good. Autonomous zones, people taking over an entire part of a city. Listen, I'm all for free speech. I'm all for protesting. And you know what? There needs to be protest against inequity and bias and racism. There needs to be, but not, not evil. You know what? They were, those protesters we're destroying lifelong businesses. They destroyed them and ruined people. Awful. Look at this next. Just before I start lesson two, I want you to see what the New Testament says here. This is from the New Living Translation. It's probably a little different than you're used to hearing it. But Paul says the temptations in your life, if you go in the context before this, boom, 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 boom. He's got a whole list of sins. The temptations in your life are no different than what others experience. Adam and Eve experienced them. Daniel and his friends. Jesus was tempted in all ways as you and I were, yet was without sin. We're all tempted. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. See, we got to take a stand. And he's not going to allow you to face something you can't take a stand. He'll never give you a test that you can't pass. When you're tempted, he'll show you a way out so you can endure. Glory to God. So God will help you say no to the temptation and to pass the test. 
Now when we get to this next section in Daniel chapter 1, what we see is this. The Babylonians, they could change Daniel's name. They could change his diet. They could change his textbooks. They could change his home. But guess what? The one thing that they couldn't change was his mind. They couldn't change his mind. Look at verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart. Let me put that in modern lingo. But Daniel made up his mind. Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself. See, the king, the king's uh, flunky, his right-hand man, Ash Painaz, came to him and said, Okay, guys, three, the next three years, here's what the king says I'm supposed to do to you. This is what you're going to eat. This is going to be your name. These are going to be your textbooks. This is, okay, he's got the whole list here. And Daniel's like, uh-oh. <laughs> that food is not kosher. That food dishonors God for Old Testament believers. I can't eat pork. I can't eat lobster. I can't eat shrimp. All that, okay, these are the kings. that It didn't tell us what they were, but those are the kind of things. Or, hey, listen, or it could be good food, but it was offered to an idol. It could have been good food that had been offered to an idol. Prayers had been said over it to an idol, and that was another problem. But all that to say, everybody, Daniel wouldn't defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Daniel took a stand for God. Daniel was only 15, 15 years old. But he knew what the king wanted him to do was wrong. And that leads us to lesson number two. When tested, we must decide that we will do what God wants, even though it may involve great risk. Remember the lady at the beginning of the, of the sermon, the nurse? Wow, she risked losing her job. First day of work. Daniel, his friends, hey, if they said, uh, sorry, I don't care what you say, we're not eating that food. That food is unholy. It will defile me before God. It's a sin for me to eat this food and I'm not going to do it. Okay? Now, Babylon didn't mess around with rebels. If they went up to that guy and said that, we're not doing this, guess what? <laughs> it wouldn't have taken him five minutes. Okay, you sure? Yeah, we're sure. We're not dishonoring God. Okay, come on, follow me. <laughs> okay, throw him, in the, throw him in the hole. They didn't mess around with rebels. You didn't, mess, you didn't rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. They saw Nebuchadnezzar as God. It was do or die. And of course, you know what? None of us may be ever called to die for God. But you know what? You're going to be called into situations where you're going to have risks involved. Uh, let me give you, for instance, losing your job, being ridiculed by your friends. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. Oh, and you're going to risk being embarrassed and humiliated, being rejected because you're not willing to do what others want you to do. There's all kinds of risks. So Daniel wisely, wisely, wisely goes to the king's chief of staff and he makes the request found in verse 8, the end of verse 8. Therefore, 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 he says, I can't do this. I've made up my mind. I've made up my mind. I'm not going to defile myself. I'm not going to do it. If I have to die, I'll die. But then, you know what, wisely, it says this. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs, like you could say the chief of staff, that he might not defile himself. He made a request. Say, is there a chance that I might be able to eat something different than what the king's offering, sir? Is there a chance that we might be able to try something else? Okay, I want you to notice God's sovereignty. I want you to notice how much God's in control here. Look at verse 9. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. God had brought Daniel 
Okay? I was telling Nathan there, there's that uh, word Natan, where Nathan's name comes from. It's used three times. And he brought Daniel. Okay? Or it's a word give, bring. That idea, Natan, okay, into favor and the goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. There's the sovereignty of God. God's working behind the scenes. You know what? The guy he's asking if they could have some different food, God is the one that worked in that guy's heart. Okay? Now, in verse 10, the, chief, the king's chief of staff tells Daniel initially uh, probably something like, No way, Jose. <laughs> The king told me to feed you this way, and that's what you're going to eat. I'm not going to lose my head over this. But does Daniel give up? Does he throw in the towel? No, look what he does in verse 11. So Daniel said to the steward, Please test your servants for 10 days. Let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Vegetable soup. <laughs> water and vegetables. <laughs> then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he, the chief of staff, consented with them in this matter, and he tested them ten days. Okay, here's what you got. Hey, let us eat just vegetables and water for ten days. Okay, all those guys over here that are eating lobster and filet mignon, let them eat that three times a day, and then let us have water and vegetables for 10 days. And we're going to make a comparison. Okay? Daniel made up his mind not to eat the king's food, but he was also wise. He asked people in charge. He used wisdom. He didn't just say something like this. He doesn't just say, well, I guess that I'm going to have to obey God. Can you go ahead and put that next slide up? He doesn't say this. He doesn't say, okay, he's in circumstances in which you could make an appeal to your boss, okay, or your superior. If you're like that, if you can do that when you're being tested, do it. Because here's why. You, you shouldn't just say this, well, I guess I'm just going to have to lose my job. No, go to your superior and make an appeal. Say, hey, you know what? I'm struggling with this a little bit. I was wondering if I could talk to you about this. That's what Daniel did. He wasn't a dummy. He didn't say, well, I guess, my, I guess I'm going to get my head cut off. You don't have to do that. You could use wisdom and make a request. He didn't say this, I'm not eating your food. He said, hey, is there a possibility like maybe for 10 days you could try us on this diet? Why don't you make a test and see how it turns out for us? Well, Proverbs 21.10, God works in the hearts of leaders. The king's heart is like a stream of water directed by the Lord. He guides it wherever he pleases. And guess what? God guided that chief of staff's heart in Daniel's direction. He said, okay. He said, we'll do that for 10 days. You guys eat vegetable soup. These guys will eat caviar, prime rib, filet mignon, lobster, shrimp, shrimp gumbo, shrimp scampi, fried shrimp. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, <laughs> I love that. Anyway, so, so what happens? What happens is seen in verses 15 to 21. After 10 days, Daniel and his friends looked better than all those who ate and drank the king's provisions. Look at them. They looked terrific. I mean, man, they were great. And then, hey, by the way, did, do we have a picture of what happened to the king, what happened to the guys that ate the king's food? Do we have that? Oh. <laughs> Java the Hut was one of those guys. Oh, my goodness. I didn't know that. But, yeah, that's what happened. You eat. Uh, all that fancy food, and it just clogs your arteries, and man, it's just bad. You get, get diabetes. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So anyway, okay, that's verse 15. Daniel and his friends, man, they're all looking good, and the other guys, oh, they're not doing too good. They're like, they can't get up till 11 a.m. and all kinds. Okay. Verse 17. Verse 17. Daniel and his friends are given knowledge and skill from God. Not only do they look better physically, God supernaturally, Nathan, there's that word again, God gave it to them, gave them knowledge and skill. Daniel is especially blessed. All of them got knowledge and skill. Daniel gets the ability to interpret dreams and visions. And then in verse 19, let's look at 19. We've got to go quickly here. The king, uh, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, interviews them. Nebuchadnezzar pulls Daniel and his three friends in, and he says, among them there was none 
found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. The king's interviewing them, and he says, Wow, you know what? None of all these young people that I have brought are like you. You guys are amazing. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Thus, Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. That's 70 years. That's uh, it's almost 70 years later. I think he lived longer than the first year of Cyrus. I think he actually lived a little longer than that, but he continued until at least the first year of Cyrus. That's a long life in Babylon, 70 years. He's, he was 85 nearly, somewhere around there. So this is an amazing victory for Daniel and his friends. What could have resulted in their death, everybody led to them becoming right-hand men of the king. And this is our final lesson today, okay? Our final lesson. We know we're going to be tested, okay? we got to make up our mind that we're going to honor God and use wisdom. And finally, taking a stand for God leads to reward from God. Now, listen to me. Many times on earth, always in heaven, you know what? Sometimes you take a stand for God on earth and you don't get rewarded down here. Jesus took a stand for God and they nailed him to a cross. His reward came in eternity. His reward came in seeing many children being brought to him spiritually. He didn't get to see an earthly reward for that. But God will not forget in eternity when you honor him with your life. Okay? Daniel and his friends served before the king. You say, Pastor Bob, that's the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? Daniel and his friends served before the king. Look at Revelation 3.21. Those who are victorious. Okay, watch this, everybody. Robert, you got me? Okay, good. <laughs> I'm walking away from the Okay, I'm walking through my life. I'm running the marathon for God, and I want to cross one day when I die. I want to cross the finish line. You got to cross the finish line victoriously. Listen, listen, do you get the gold, silver, or bronze if you're running the marathon? You ran tw 24, 25 miles. You got one more mile to go, and you, and you, and you collapse. Do you get, a, you get rewarded for that? I don't see any head shaking. Okay, you're supposed to be going like this. Okay, okay. No! You don't get rewarded for collapsing. No, he, those who are victorious, you cross the finish line for God. You're not in the ditch of sin somewhere. You haven't been backslidden for 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years. You cross the finish line honoring God. Those who are victorious, by the way, the Greek word Nike, it's where we get our Nike shoes from. That's the word for victory in Greek, Nike. Okay, Nikao. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne. You're going to serve like Daniel and his friends did with the king. But it won't be Nebuchadnezzar, it'll be the Lord Jesus Christ. So if we stay faithful to the Lord until our dying breath, we're going to serve before the king, we'll rule with him forever. Let me ask you this, everybody, everyone in here, is that your goal in life? Is that your goal in life? Is your goal in life to hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant, and then one day to serve with him on his throne? For him to say to you, hey, you know what, Marilyn, you know what, you honored me from the time you got saved until you died you honored me with your life and i want you to sit with me on my throne i'm going to give you i'm going to give you a part in my empire in my royal kingdom i've got you you know what you worked with for me on earth i've got special work for you to do in eternity is that what you want or do you want the other side of the coin of the christians Yes, the Christians, the born-again believers, who are going to hear this. You wicked and lazy servant. You knew my will, and you didn't do it. Give him the reward of a hypocrite. Give her the reward of a hypocrite. Ooh, listen. 
I want rewards in eternity, but I don't want the reward of a hypocrite. That's going to be rough. Okay? So is your goal in life to stand for God so that you might rule with him? Is it? Is that your goal? I hope so. I hope so. I've yelled at you about it enough through the years. Hey, by the way, you say, Pastor Bob, what happened to the lady? What happened? What happened to the nurse? She walked outside of the room. And she's in the hallway and mulling us all over. And all of a sudden, the doctor walks up. And you know what? She, in that split second, she made up her mind. Doctor, I made a terrible mistake. And he went, whoa. She told him what happened. He went, whoa. I'm going to have to think about that. And then he went into the room. And he told the woman what had happened, and everything worked out fine. She understood. She didn't lose her marbles. She didn't say, I'm going to sue. No. That lady kept her job, and everything was fine, and it was not a problem. The doctor said, you can come in in two or three months, and you can get the correct vaccination. It's not going to be a problem. So he explained things, okay. So God, she told the doctor what happened. God took care of her. She took a stand. Can I just close with a story? I've told you this story many times. But of course, you know, I didn't come to Jesus until I was 19. From the time I was 16, 17, 18, those three years were not good years for me. Up to that time, they were great. Those three years, not so great because on weekends, I would go to parties. Friday night, Saturday night, maybe Sunday night even. Three nights a week. Alcohol, drunkenness, drugs, the whole schmeal, okay? You know, during that time, I ne told you I've nearly overdosed twice. I came that close to dying, young people. Listen, I came that close to dying and going to hell. Twice from drug overdoses. That close. I was not a believer. I was not a believer. And you know, after I got saved, you know, I was going right back with my old friends. I wasn't taught yet. And so on Friday night came around after I got saved, and I got saved on a Wednesday night, and Friday night came, and so I went back to the parties. But then you know what? Real soon after that, I quit taking six packs of Budweiser, and I would take six packs of Pepsi. Pepsi in cans. And then, like, they started to catch on, and they're like, hey, Bob, what's up with the Pepsi? What's up with the Pepsi? And I said, hey, you know what? You all know this. You know what? I've, I've become a Christian. I've become a Christian. I'm a Christian now. And you know what? I just decided, you know, I didn't want to get drunk anymore. You know what? I just decided that, uh, and then they started giving me grief. Oh, man, we did that, too. When we were in high school, man, we went to that. We went to the church and the big rally, and we went down there, and, and we prayed the prayer and all that. And then, you know, we went back to church after that, and, man, those preachers started yelling at us, telling us we couldn't, we couldn't uh, you know, they were telling us we couldn't uh, get with the women and all that stuff, and we couldn't drink, and we couldn't do, and we said, later, man. We, you know, they were all saying the same kind of thing to me, giving me grief. And you know what, young people, here's what I told them. After they all had a chance to hammer me, here's what I told them that night. I can remember it as clear as day. I basically said something like this. Well, you know what? I don't know about all of that, but I do know this. Regardless of what you're going to do, I know what I'm going to do, and I'm, I'm going to go forward for God. I told them that right in the middle of this raucous party there. I'm going to go forward for God. And you know what, everybody? This coming Saturday, it's going to be 41 years. June 20th. June 20th. Young, young people, you know what? I turned to, to Jesus at that welding factory, and within a couple of weeks, I said, I'm putting my hand to God's plow out in his field, and I'm not looking back. 
Oh, look what I'm going to miss. Oh, man, woo-hoo. No, I started plowing for God 41 years ago, and guess what? I haven't quit. I'm not saying I have sin, but I haven't gone out in the ditch of sin. I haven't gone away from God. I've been fighting and fighting, and I plan, Lord willing, with his grace, I plan on doing that, hopefully, for another 41 years. I'll be 101 nearly, or 100. I'll be 100. <laughs> okay, so anyway. Okay, so you're going to be tested. It may be very risky, but the rewards are out of this world. And so I just want to ask you before I pray, are you ready to quit waffling? Are you ready to quit waffling? And I don't mean waffling like this. I'm talking about waffling, being on the fence. Being on the fence. You're wobbly because you're looking over here at what the world has and you're looking over here at what God has and you don't know. You're wobbly, you know, you're like... What am I going to do? Am I going to follow my friends or am I going to follow God? Follow God. I'm so thankful now, 41 years since I was your age, I can look back and say, yes, 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 yes. I got 41 years of treasure laid up in heaven. Hallelujah. I don't have to look back at train wreck, spiritual train wrecks. Oh, yeah, for five years there I was getting drunk, and then, oh, oh, yeah, eight years there, I was off the charts. Oh, I, you get the idea. Are you ready to quit waffling? Are you ready to quit walk, walking the fence? From this day forward, are you going to choose to take a stand for God? Are you going to make up your mind? You won't defile yourself. Are you going to make up your mind to take a stand for God? That's what Daniel 1 asks you and I. Let's have a, have a word of prayer. Father, I pray for all of us, Lord, that your hand would rest on us and help us to make wise decisions. Help us to make up our minds that we aren't going to defile ourselves no matter what. Help us, Father. We need it. And God, I pray that you'll guard these young people especially, Lord, but all of us, from bad thinking from unbiblical thinking, from thinking that doesn't please you. Help them to learn your ways and to never veer, never turn aside. And we prayed in the name above every name, the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, amen. Let's give God praise today for his word. Thank you, everybody. By the way, before we dismiss, I want to let you know I got to talk with Bob Ernst yesterday. If you didn't know, Dolores fell and broke her hip. He said what had happened at night, she was walking through the hallway and where they have a two-step dip. You know, like where you come out of the hallway from the bedrooms and it goes down two steps. She didn't turn the light on in the hallway and when she got to the steps, she just took another step, boom, she went down. And so... Um, so nonetheless, they took her to Athens, and none of the hospitals in East Texas wanted to deal with her for whatever reason. So Bob had to get the ambulance from Athens and take her all the way to downtown Big Baylor. So she's in rehab now in downtown Dallas. She's had surgery. She's doing rehab. And Bob, uh, Bob believe it or not, is traveling every day. He's 87, and he's driving from Canton. So there he stays with her all night. He comes back. He takes care of the dog. Turns back around. Drives back there. He's done that every day this week. But you know what? He said, I'm a tough critter. <laughs> Something like that. He told me on the phone. The nurses called him. They said, man, you're, you're a tough cracker, dude. So anyway, uh, pray for Bob and Dolores. They need all of our prayers. All right? So, all right, have a wonderful week. Hopefully you'll be with us for our prayer meeting on Wednesday night on the computer or you can call up on your phone, look in the bulletin, it's there on the third page or fourth page, one of them, but you can find the information you need. You can call right in on your phone and take part with us. All right, have a blessed week, everybody. God bless.